the stage of today. Um, congratulations to everyone that's made it through. It's been a you've been having a lovely day. Um, welcome to our session. Um, the catchy title of Designing Immersive Biofeedback Experiences to Understand and Manage Our Well-Being. Um, so just an introduction. My name is Sarah Tico. Um, I am a person of many hats and severe ADHD. So uh, I work broadly across the field of immersive technology and healthcare. Um, I do work with this fine two over here um, on a project called Explore Deep that you'll find more about. Um, and also I've been doing a lot of work to support the adoption of immersive technology in healthcare in the UK as well. So I've been bothering the government to think about what does a joined up strategy for immersive tech in healthcare look like? How can we start prescribing experiences and making them more accessible as a therapeutic tool, how it can be used in medical training um, and education, but also um, as a social prescribing tool. How can we actually use immersive technology in preventative care? Um, and so we've heard a lot about how VR can be used in reducing anxiety and pain and phobias um, across the board. But uh, I think a really interesting area is the world of biofeedback and how we bring our bodies into that experience as well. So, um, so what we're going to do is introduce all of our brilliant, uh, talented panel today. We're going to be looking at the broad spectrum of academia and scientific approaches to biofeedback, but also what happens when you work with artists and creatives. How do you bring this technology alive and make it compelling through stories and visuals and multi-sensory experiences? So we're going to start with a little zip through of introductions. Um, about everyone's work and then uh, jump into a conversation because we have a lot to say and not very much time. So um, over to you, uh, Julia, our first speaker, and here are your slides, your clicker, and I'm okay. Okay. Hello, um, I'm Julia Sky. I work over at Santa Clara University in um, California, and um, but the lab that I've built, sorry, there we go. Okay. So the lab that I built is inside of the healthcare innovation and design program, where we look at healthcare problems very broadly and within our disciplines, uh, partner in building those solutions with external stakeholders. So for my area of focus, it's neurotechnology and virtual reality. Um, that's, that's my sweet spot, but there are others working on the business side, healthcare communications, and so on. But what I wanna highlight today is the, a couple of the projects that we have built internally um, that are using biofeedback to build tools for mental health, um, particularly for youth, for that teenage period of time, um, to develop the skills of self-regulation, so uh, fluorescence and mandala flow state. Um, and just to give the very high-level intro uh, course on biofeedback, um, and you get the next level course from Philip, is that you have, <laughs> you have at the heart of it um, some physiological metric that is related to the mental state, um, the bodily state that you want to better understand or better regulate. That has to be processed from that raw data into uh, clean data. And then you have to extract that signal that you're confident actually means something. That signal then needs to be turned into a, a parameter within the experience um, that some type of game mechanic that fits into the experience and the story that the person actually interacts with. And that will then modify that key metric and it starts the cycle again. So you get this real-time update. And the art of it, and part of what we're gonna talk about today, is how do you make that a wonderful experience? Um, and with fluorescence, this was, this was a one where we wanted to build a system that uh, dealt with emotional reactivity. So your reflexive reactions that may be a little bit um, uncalibrated with your actual life experience. So this was done by a team of high school students um, that learned how to build in VR, learned how to build their sensors, um, and designed the entire experience from scratch. So in this particular one, um, you can launch it here. Does this work? Uh, Ready this? Does it work? Nope. Does it work? Does that work? Okay. Well, this is a video. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it works. It works. It works. Okay. Okay. It's working. Okay. All right. Yeah. It's working. Um, so what they did, they built this uh, glowworm cave experience where you walk through and as you go through different biomes, it goes from calming environments to tense environments where the music changes, the rock patterns change, and so on. And that lantern that you're holding as you walk through this is reflecting your heart rate. Um, so you're trying to keep that heart rate cool 
um, keep it in that neutral zone um, or to reduce it down. And you're building that awareness through going um, through this, ex this walking experience. So um, I was reminded this was built by 16 year olds. Pretty awesome. Um, the other project is Mandala Flow State, and this is one that I co-designed with the San Francisco Asian Art Museum. And they were looking to create a kind of a technology analog to what was done in traditional, um, traditional Buddhist mandalas. Uh, and so we co-created this experience that ran with a special exhibit and that walked through the visualization of a Tibetan mandala. And then we're in San Francisco, and in San Francisco we have a lot of fog. So our, our metaphor for our brain fog, for that lack of clarity, was this, um, was this cloud that is linked to the, linked that, uh, the EEG and looking at the alpha metric, which is that correlate for focused relaxation. So as your level of relaxation increased, that fog will dissipate and you get to see the beautiful mandala like it's beautiful. Um, and at the end, in the impermanence, it gets swept away like sand. So this is how we kind of build the story arc and the science together. All right, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Philip Pitts. I work for OpenBCI. I'm the head of software at OpenBCI. And at our company, we build tools for neuroscience and biosensing. And kind of our goal is to uh, make it easier, lower the barrier to entry to get into brain computer interfaces. Um, what I'm going to show right now is kind of an introduction to how you get uh, biosensing data into your applications. I'm going to do this with one of the um, demonstrations that we recently did um, with our friend Christian. Let's see. Start the video. I'm just gonna step over here and start the video, I think. <laughs> All right, okay. I'm just gonna start the video, right. And so what we have here is a um, demonstration of our friend Christian, who is um, piloting this quadcopter. It's a combination of um, a lip joystick that he had and a biosensing uh, plus XR headset. And so this is a, a modified version of a headset that we have um, at OpenCI. It's called our Gallia headset, and it includes a variety of different uh, modalities. And Christian is using a couple of these to give him additional control um, over this drone and increase his autonomy over, over his flight here. So let's talk about how this happened and which biosensors um, played a part into, into making games like this and experiences like this possible. There are a couple of different modalities that you'll see as you get into biofeedback. There's EEG, which is measuring your brain. There's EMG, which is measuring your muscles. E EDA, which is measuring your skin and kind of skin perspiration. There's PPG, which measures your heart rate and also how much oxygen is in your blood. So it's really interesting. If you hold your breath, you can see actually your uh, SpO2 is what it's called, your uh, blood oxygenation level go down. Uh, EOG, which is measuring your eye activity and eye tracking. Um, which is obviously looking at where uh, where your eyes are focused. When you start to get different types of biometric data, you will usually see something that looks kind of like this. It's a bunch of signals, lots of squiggles across the screen, um, and it's a little bit hard to interpret if you aren't an expert at looking at a particular modality. And so usually what we'll do is we'll take these raw signals, we'll condition them, we'll clean them, we'll remove environmental noise and artifacts, and then we will translate them into more meaningful information. So here's an example of the EMG that we did. Um, Have you returned the model into digital And so these are signal processes That's all right. Um, and so basically what we have is uh, these raw signals that you can turn into different um, buttons um, that can be actuated. And then we took those buttons and we turned them into a 2D joystick um, using kind of X and Y for those four different buttons. And those four buttons, that EMG joystick, is what Christian used um, to pilot uh, this drone. So if you're familiar with drones, uh, they usually, you usually pilot them with two different joysticks. Um, he had one joystick. 
already for his um, left joystick, and we gave him the second one, which was controlled with that EMG um, joystick. And so uh, this is just one example of how you can get uh, biometrics into an interesting, immersive experience. There are many, many others. There's lots of different hardware out there. There's lots of different modalities to play with. And so with that, I'm going to pass it on um, to our next speaker who can talk a little bit more about it. Um, my name is David Lobser. Uh, I'm an artist, designer, a VR developer, XR developer. Um, I've been, uh, I worked in the animation industry in New York for a long time and uh, directed uh, short narrative content and uh, worked on some movies. Uh, in the last uh, five years or so, I've uh, refocused my energies on the therapeutic space in various ways. Um, uh, uh, a project that I'm putting a lot of energy into these days is called Visitations. It's an app that was designed uh, to uh, pair with ketamine-assisted um, therapy. Um, it started off uh, in collaboration with a clinic in Midtown Manhattan, and we've been using it for about four years in that context. Um, so the idea is to, you know, the initial idea was to just create a nicer space to have those experiences in. A lot of these clinics are very clinical fluorescent lights, gray walls, that kind of thing. So like the, the main goal was just to uh, create a better place for people to have these um, you know, experiences that can be very deep uh, and, um, uh, and meaningful for people. And um, uh, we've been doing uh, this in group settings more recently. So we're actually doing this for groups of up to 12 or 15 people at the same time. Uh, so another project that I was doing at the same time is called Luxurgapism, and uh, sadly the pandemic shut this down, but it was a location-based spa, and the idea that we wanted to create was basically a, a digital art corollary to a visit to like a Russian Turkish bath. So instead of going into a hot wet room, hot dry room, and then a cold dip, uh, we put people in a vibrating water bed with a strobe light that was interactive, and we had interactive projections and ASMR sound experiences and things like that. And uh, the experience of seeing people come into this space and leave just like much more relaxed and grounded was very inspiring and uh, like that's inspired me to continue working in this space. Uh, so this is a project called, let's see if it'll play. Uh, this project is called Nevermind. And this project was done in collaboration with a company called Cyber, which is part of the a Thai Life Sciences Group, which is a psychedelic drug discovery company. And um, the way this project works is that people are in it, they're using an EEG, a um, Muse headset actually, uh, and these meditations were set up so that people could get relaxed and focused before having uh, an experience with a psilocybin analog. So part of the idea was to create uh, scenes where the uh, complexity of the scene would increase based on how focused you were and for how long. And I think we'll talk more about the user experience design aspects of this as we get into the panel. So this is all a uh, compute shader work, um, and it's running on a quest. Um, so in terms of uh, working with patients who are on uh, so yeah in terms of working with patients who are incapacitated or you know are on substances uh, there are definitely a lot of design considerations for that including like reorienting the headset to which direction they're facing in like thinking about uh, what kind of interaction they're going to be able to do like preparing them in certain ways uh, we can get into that too in more detail. Uh, so these are some of the techniques that I was uh, that I I bring to um, experiences in this space. So visual strobing sort of has an effect or like directly that's measurable on an EEG. So certain 
frequencies show up on an EEG, I think there's some questions about whether that actually helps you get into those mental states, um, but it definitely has some subjective effects. Uh, tunnels and spirals just like help you focus on the spot as opposed to um, not knowing where to look and looking all over the place, like having a point of focus is really important. Uh, symmetry is like another thing that like makes people feel comfortable and relaxed. Um, uh, sort of slow oscillations that mimic, um, you know, the speed of breath, the speed of the heart are also something else that I use. Uh, procedural generation means that the scenes are always changing, they never loop, they're always different. Um, and then fractals are just a thing that uh, humans respond to very naturally. Uh, we like natural things, our bodies are fractals. Uh, so this is the name of my studio. I do uh, production work. Let's see, did we leave that up? Uh, so I don't have like the list of my clients up here, but I do uh, production work for uh, different kinds of healthcare companies these days, primarily. Amazing. I'm a fan of your work. Um, so, uh, hey everybody, my name is Nikki Smith. I am uh, co-founder of uh, companies Explore Deep and Mono Banda, and I call myself a designer of play. And that distinction is important to me because to me, play is something different than a game designer. So if we look at games, games are very much about rules, about being goal-driven, about achieving things and getting, getting agency, a sense of agency and mastery and dopamine out of that. The other side of that coin is free play. So if games are ludic, ludum, then the other side of that coin is paideia, which is free play, which is a, uh, which is a kid jumping, jumping up and down in the leaves, two jazz players jamming with each other, two people flirting with each other. It is that deep connection between um, being, having, and feeling enough agency that you're in control of your body and your mind, that you feel a connection between both of them and can enjoy uh, the world around you and yourself in, in, a, in a very, uh, in a way where you basically experience your own body as this, this beautiful uh, thing that, that is powerful. Um, I come from a half game design, half theater background. So for the last 15 years, we've been making uh, with Mona Banda and uh, later Explore Deep, we've been making experiences where you're always in control with your body, that are always for a part about not achieving goals, but just being in the moment. And I'm here to talk about Deep. And Deep is a meditative virtual reality game controlled by deep belly breathing. We've been working on this for since 2015. Um, when we, as artists, found out that, hey, we're, we're, um, we're always searching for new game mechanisms and new ways to control uh, and, feel, uh, and feel in control, have a feeling of agency. And having controlling yourself in a 360 no gravity floating environment, like underwater, uh, with your breath, turned out to feel instinctively very satisfying and very logical. And so we started working on that. And very quickly when we made the first prototypes, um, we got approached by, by scientists and psychologists. And we're like, oh my god, you've made the thing that we want people to do, um, but we can't get them to do it. And that's, of course, where we as designers of play are experts at. We are facilitating environments where you feel in control and you feel motivated um, to actually use your body in a certain way and uh, have the feeling that you're in control of your own uh, body mind, basically foster agency. So that's what we've been doing. We've been uh, making uh, and co-designing deep together with scientists, where it's this rich collaboration where game designer becomes scientists and scientists become game designers. Uh, I would like to call the process that we've been using for the last eight years a art-led, science-backed process, where we let the game design uh, lead 
as sort of a torch in the dark where we say, look, what feels, what feels most intuitive? What feels nicest? Let's start from that. Let's start by what makes the player feel good and in control, because that's the core thing that we need to start with. And then walk back from there and see like, hey, okay, so we have this behavior, we facilitate humming, uh, 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 talking, uh, breathing, etc. And how we, and in, in what scientific or mental well-being framing could we put that? So yeah, it, it started out as an art project, but we very quickly met up with uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Johanneke here, and it has been growing ever since with more and more partners uh, because breath is, breathing is such an integral part of our human experience that it can actually be employed to a whole bunch of different topics. Yeah, uh, hi everyone, my name is Johanneke Weermeester, I'm a behavioral scientist, and um, I initially started as a I thought I was going to become a psychologist, but then I went on to more of the science part, and that is because I um, met up with uh, the Games for Emotional and Mental Health Lab. And that was a lab led by um, a professor, Dr. Isabel Granick, um, who was uh, at the time starting in this lab to see, can we use games for good? Can we use games to help children and youth that are struggling with mental health? Because they're already playing games, that's a world they already inhabit, so how can we uh, leverage that. And so uh, when I started my PhD, it was almost like uh, destiny that um, uh, my professor met up with uh, the team of Deep when they were running a small pilot at a, a media festival back then with a very early version of Deep. And it was, uh, yeah, the lightning <laughs> struck. And um, yeah, we wanted to see, can we uh, make something that is such a nice intuitive idea? And can we collaborate together to see what can we put in that we know from science, that we know from uh, clinical psychology to um, yeah, grow the experience and see whether it can help people to help uh, regulate their anxiety, for instance. Um, so yeah, um, then I joined uh, the team of DEEP and I did some research on there and just to elaborate a little bit more about how DEEP works. So yeah, DEEP works through diaphragmatic breathing. So you wear this uh, controller belt around your diaphragm, it has a stretch control in it, or now it has uh, two magnets, basically, um, and uh, measures the distance between them. And um, the way that you control the game is through breathing. Um, this deep belly breathing, it controls the buoyancy, basically. So the deeper and calmer you're able to breathe, the better you're able to move through this world and explore the environment. Um, which is, so it gives you feedback on your breathing. It happens in different ways, so it happens through the movement, but also in visuals around you. So the whole world breathes with you. So you see these plants lighting up and dimming. You always have this circle in the middle, and it gives you an immediate sense of, I am in control. And you can see the changes happening directly in front of you. It's basically like this interactive breathing exercise almost. Um, so it has this nice visualization component, reinforcement component. It shows you if you're, for instance, breathing very shallowly, you'll be stuck more on the floor of the ocean and you know, okay, I have to go deeper and lift up from the floor and you go on. Um, so yeah, that really um, reinforces the children and the players to uh, use this deep dive part of breathing, which you already knew from psychology and from meditation and from all different practices that this deep belly, belly breathing can be very effective for anxiety regulation. Um, but as you can see, like deep was a very like, calming environment. It's very nice, it's very beautiful. Uh, but we also know from uh, anxiety treatment that it's very important to face your fears, basically, and to find ways to overcome it. Um, so we also have been experimenting a bit more with creating uh, environments that are initially elicit more of this sense of stress and the sense of anxiety. So as you can also see and, and practice this deep dive breathing when you are in those environments and get a sense of control there. So yeah, initial research that we did was mostly focused on anxiety, or that I did, so we ran a bunch of smaller pilots, but also bigger randomized control trials with uh, younger children, uh, also with students with elevated anxiety symptoms. Um, and we found some very promising results. Um, they were, um, we found that DEEP was able to directly help people um, lower their anxiety, but also that over the course of a more extensive training, it um, helped them to uh, decrease anxiety symptoms in general as well. Um, 
And um, yeah, we initially started most work on anxiety, but then like Nikki already mentioned before, because grieving is such a trans diagnostic, as we would say, mechanism. So it, it ties to all different types of areas. So it's not just anxiety, but for instance, if you're, if you're maybe struggling with anger or other things, it can help in a variety of different ways. We got um, contacted by a lot of different areas. So now it has uh, moved on, for instance, to um, areas we didn't even think of in the first place. Um, like, for instance, uh, when COVID struck, of course, and we were contacted by that. But now, uh, for instance, we're also running a pilot in uh, uh, youth detention centers, which are very underserved populations that deal with a lot of uh, trauma and a lot of also high stress um, with a brave uh, research center in Madison, Wisconsin. And um, yeah, they found some very uh, promising results there as well. So that to, to see really that these youth get a better control of their breathing and that it also uh, seems to um, transfer to outside of the experience. So yeah, it's nice to see that it keeps growing and we see more different potential for these kinds of uh, experiences. And if you want to look up all of the research, you can find it on our website. Lovely. Thank you. All right, I'm going to try and multitask here for a second. And do the thing that doesn't work. Do it a different way. That's fine. Oh, no. I've got it. Um, great. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for your intros. We thought it would be really helpful to give a real um, visual deep dive into the work of everyone on the panel. And um, I was really enthusiastic to do this panel because I think outside of Games for Change, we often live in a world that uh, is very siloed between art and science, that uh, you often have a lot of healthcare providers and researchers that might come up with a cool biofeedback experience, but it often looks a bit naff, and you develop a, piece, a paper on it, and then it dies, and no one sees it again. And then on the other side of the spectrum, uh, there's often artists that make incredible stories, right? Like we all play games and experience these um, incredible, incredible, playful types of media. But how do you meet in the middle? How do you form these cross-disciplinary collaborations um, and actually bring them into the world? And, um, and it turns out it's harder than, than I thought it would be right in the beginning of my career when I was just like, yeah, you just bring an artist and a scientist together, like get a bit of funding and uh, it'll be fine. And it turns out it's a bit more challenging than that. And, um, and so uh, I'd be interested to now open up the, the conversation a little bit to talk about like, what is that process like? Um, how do you find your collaborators in this field? And um, perhaps Julia, like you are a researcher based within a university and have been working with um, artists as well as developing that research and um, I'd be interested in, in your process of collaboration and then we'll open it up to the others as well. Um, so with Mandala Flow State, as I mentioned, this was a museum collaboration. So the first, niche, first version of this I had done um, just completely procedurally generated as a geometric mandala you know, we know math at the university that we can do that. Um, we actually have artists too. But uh, when when it got you know commissioned by the museum, it became a co-design. So it was working very closely with the curator for the for the exhibit and understanding his perspective on what he was trying to communicate through this, and actually study the study the artworks as the scientists. We had to go and and become familiar with them, understand the symbolism. And then uh, we would brainstorm and come to him with like a dozen ideas of how we could translate it. And then he'd take that evaluation of, okay, which of these actually um, align the best? Which can we uh, te technically modify the easiest and have that back and forth and go through like that rapid prototyping phase until we could get something that was the balance between the two. Um, and then we have to figure out how do we make this an experience that we can put in a museum lobby and get people set up within three minutes, get through the experience in 12, so that we have a new person every 15 minutes um, and have them be happy uh, and engage the people around you. So setting up the, the environment where they're in a tent, uh, we had to create a tent uh, in that space uh, for the person to come into, to enter into that calm environment, get them physically set up with the EEG and the VR device and then on the outside, we had um, we had a display panel so that people could see what the person was experiencing in parallel to their brain activity. And so you would 
it became a, um, a bit of a, uh, not sure if these like, like performance, I mean, but not really. But the person inside didn't realize they were, they were performing, so they had that because they were in that tense space. So we had to consider, you know, what was scientifically possible, what was technically possible, what met the mission of, um, of for the museum, and then what made a really, uh, really engaging user experience uh, for the museum goers. And part of doing this mix of, you know, design of, um, you know, kind of the traditional and the modern uh, was to bring that gener that that connection from, you know, the ancient that's in the uh, in the exhibit with all those artifacts. And then how can it be interpreted today and be relevant for people now? Um, so I, to the most part, I think we met that met that brief based on the feedback we collected. Um, so that would be my story. Um, David, I feel like you've had a very different journey as an artist that has been embedding fire feedback into your work. And I'd love to hear a little bit about your process of how you first got started with working with this and playing with um, this media, and then how you've collaborated with um, researchers and scientists as well. Gosh, this, this, yeah. this is the good one. Okay. Good one. You can hear me? Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, actually, like the, I mean, the way that I find collaborators, I guess, is just by, by making things and, and trying to get them out there and get them seen and, and talking to people. Um, so I guess in the spirit of that, I, uh, did, there's a research project we did about four years ago that's been sort of like slowly in the process of getting out there. Uh, the clinic I did it with is interested in doing another project, specifically with uh, groups uh, doing ketamine therapy. So if anybody's interested in that, and if you're a researcher, <laughs> so maybe that's one way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all been a very organic process. It sort of started with um, uh, like the, the, very, the seed of all of this was I was learning some new tools and making things that I was interested in making for myself sharing those like amongst friends, like friends told other friends, like introductions were made, and then that sort of gets it to the next step of like, oh, what's interesting about this for you? Like, how can we work together to like get this to, to work in your space? So it's, um, you know, it's like all of this, it, it's been very organic, you know, nothing that I've done has necessarily started off with a very specific goal. It's been more like there's, there's a realm of things that we're interested in and we're kind of, I think, you know, a, a lot of the stuff that everybody's doing in the therapeutic space is figuring it out as we're making it. It's like we have a general goal of helping people and increasing well-being, like we want to make beautiful things, like deep is incredibly beautiful. Um, and you know, we, we just want to make people feel better and improve their lives. And like exactly how we do that is comes as a result of the people we meet and, love and working together. Thank you. Because yeah, I think often we, in the rest of the world, it's a real conversation around like art versus science that you have to almost negotiate between the two of you um, or the different groups of you about what is the priority. And there can often be a bit of a top down approach, right? Of there is a scientist that wants to do something and you want to add something shiny on top. So, um, Nikki, perhaps a, qu a question to you then about that kind of juxtaposition of uh, creative versus the science and um, and I guess some of the interesting surprises you might have had along the way in that collaborative process and working alongside researchers. Yeah, that is a tension field for sure. And I think it will always be that because you have different kinds of artists and you have different kinds of scientists. And I think I had the luck of immediately um, finding scientific collaborators that came to me with quite open context. So uh, Dr. Isabel Granick was like, like, look, you're already doing breathing. Breathing works. Um, keep what you're doing. As long as you keep on breathing, we can work together. And that, as, as an artist, is a relief. But then, of course, you start to dig into it. Yeah, but what do you really need? What do you need to measure it? What extra things do you need on top of that? And then, then it becomes this, this, this fragile state where you want people to talk, where you want, where you want everybody to talk from their own expertise and not immediately be tempted to jump across the pond and do the other person's job. So what happens a lot of the times is, 
oh yeah, we maybe if you put this and this in the game, because they see it in front of them too, because everybody is creative. Um, but then sometimes people jump to the end conclusion, <coughs> we, should, uh, we should design this game mechanic or we should design this experience. But instead of that, I had the luck at the beginning of my long collaboration with scientists to work with scientists that say like, look, what's important for Deep is a mirroring aspect and a, and a modeling aspect. Oh, no, what's mirroring? Well, mirroring is that you see what you're doing, you get that fat bark back to you, and I'm like, cool, let me work with that. And then we designed all these plants that bloom up at your, uh, at your breathing, uh, and all these animals that react to you. So, yeah, I think that's the biggest takeaway, to not be tempted to talk from, to do the other person's job, and really talk in an open way, go back to the core, what do you need, actually. And um, that really makes me think of uh, a comment that Garbo Aurora made this morning. Uh, he made this lovely reference to um, an artist called James Terrell, who does some really gorgeous work around uh, beautiful architectural structures and, and windows into the world. And he drew that par a parallel between that and XR that actually artists are able to almost draw attention to what is there already and the artists are really able to illustrate like the secret world of our bodies and visualize them in different ways. Um, but there's such a world of, uh, within our bodies, and I think that's what I've loved learning over the last few years, is how you can have deeper interoceptive awareness, be more aware of uh, what's happening inside through your breath, through your heart rate, through EEG. But um, as a non-scientist, it can be really overwhelming to think about like, what do all these signals mean and how do we use them and how do we translate them and um, what is their value? And so, um, Joe, I, I was curious about your work in, in, in biofeedback quite broadly and why there are certain types of, of biofeedback that you use and also just like the practicality of implementing it as well because it's all very well having like a 500 channel ECG or whatever it is, clearly I'm not a scientist. Um, and that definitely doesn't exist. But, um, but how do you yeah, make those decisions on what to use and um, what is that kind of uh, balance of what is the most exciting and scientific versus what is the most accessible and available? Yeah, I mean, you already mentioned some of the, the tensions there and choices because there's so, there's a big realm of these different inputs that you can choose, right? You can go for breathing, you can go for heart rate, there's skin conductance, there's, there's uh, muscle tension. Like, what do you go for first? And there's different choices that you make in there, and you can initially go from, okay, what is closest to the, um, the issue that you're trying to solve? Um, so, I don't know, if, you, uh, if you're trying to solve someone who is very tense, and usually it's in the body, then maybe you would go for muscle uh, uh, yeah, measurements. Or, um, so more like, what is closest to the output you're trying to see? But you also have to see, like, if you're going from a more research perspective and you need uh, accuracy because you need accurate data, then maybe you want a more accurate um, uh, measurement system um, where you can also get the data out of it. However, when we, for instance, started initially, then I would go, like, okay, what are like the validated systems that you have? And you had a huge like biopack system is what it was called when you also used it in hospitals. It was very expensive and it was, it was very, um, well, not user friendly to work with. <laughs> it was a lot of wires and you had to bring someone up to a bunch of wires and then put a headset on them. And they're like, yes, now go and relax. Okay. So maybe then it doesn't work. You have very accurate measurements, but then it's not user friendly anymore. So then you go, okay, well, what, what are the, the market um, sensors out there? Okay, well, you can have uh, heart rate, you can have breathing. Okay, maybe you can use those Fitbits that we've heard so much about um, because they've been used already so much. And then you think, okay, but can we get the data out of it? Well, we don't really know where the data is stored or where it's going or we don't really know exactly what algorithms behind it. So anyway, you have all these different back and forth things of choices. And sometimes you go for one, sometimes you go for the other. Here, of course, when we work with deep, the thing that was already there was breathing. Um, so it might be just a little bit biased, but what I like very much about breathing is that it has this very direct control in it. So you can have heart rate, but usually if you have a heart rate biofeedback uh, experience, then still the way that they tell people to modulate your heart rate is go, okay, now slow down your breathing. 
So it's a more indirect. Whereas if you have this breathing belt, it's more, you can see directly if you're changing something, you see it directly in front of you. So this sense of control, I think is very powerful in there, um, which I really like about the breathing aspect. But on the other hand, maybe you want to go for heart rate if you want to uh, have a bit more time and practice to not rely so much on this direct control and, and doing it more indirectly. So yeah, there's all these different, uh, uh, there's not really a clear answer to which one you should use. It all depends on what your target outcome is, uh, whether you uh, think accuracy is a bit more important than user friendliness, and, but also the way that you want to show the feedback. You can do it in so many different ways. You can use visuals, you can use audio, you can use haptics. The world is your oyster, basically. So I would say go out and experiment. <laughs> Definitely, and I think there's such a, a challenge in the XR industry that we're so focused on the visual, right? Especially with um, augmented reality that we just look at the visual and there's so many different possibilities of, of integrating sound and haptics and increasingly smells as well. And I think integrating biofeedback, it's actually more about more embodied mechanisms, but also uh, multi-sensory feedback as well. And, um, and artists are always the, the true um, you know, innovators and in how to bring that together um, as well. So there's so many possibilities. I feel like we could do this panel for hours because there is just so much to explore. But naturally, we are almost out of time and um, really want to finish off by opening it up to the audience. And was curious if anyone had any questions for the panel. Um, this gentleman here in the blue shirt. Thank you. Uh, my co uh, my colleague Owen uh, made it himself. So it's uh, we started out with with stretch uh, sensors, but now we went to a magnet and a receiver. Thank you. Yeah, Caitlin. Yeah, you have me thinking a lot about creativity and getting into flow states where you might actually lose the attachment to your physical body, and that could be maybe a good thing so i was wondering if you wanted to touch on that and also so many thoughts sparking about language translation do you ever find you want to codify some kind of new fluency like a data translator so that someone has whether it's colors or whether it's something like synesthesia so, so that it's not so numeric for people which might sound clinical you know either one <laughs> Uh, so, can we start with the second question? Sure. Thank you. This is awesome. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, how how the feedback is represented, um, I think in all the things we do, there are no numbers involved. They have been the user experience um, that, and that's part of the immersive aspect of this. That the the metric of the EG signal, which is power spectral density, right? Like, no one is going to have fun with power spectral density, but they are going to have fun with you know, the, the flowers opening up, you know, doors opening, the uh, lantern changing colors as it's guiding you through and that's changing the lighting of your entire experience. And it becomes um, holistic in a sense. And that's, that's one of the big differences I found between designing biofeedback in a screen-based environment and a first-person centered environment. Um, it really allows you to reinforce the that stability in your environment um, that you're in and not lose focus on, um, on your presence, right? Uh, you're not having to check a dashboard, right, to know if you're met your measurement or not right now. Um, and that's one of the design principles I try to work with consistently across the board here. Yeah, I think definitely shaking the specter of gamification was a, <laughs> a phrase that came up in our conversations before this as well. That, yeah, that you can't have win or lose states in a biofeedback experience. Like, you know, being told that you're not relaxed enough is not going to make you more relaxed, is it? And so, yeah, finding more playful ways to think about how that can be visualized feels very important. Nikki, you look like you had something to say there. Well, I just want, from my side, yeah, it's all about finding the most logical and intuitive thing. And that's what, um, like, you can match any sort of game interaction to, to anything. Uh, 
but for example, just a very bare uh, 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 bones example. Um, what do we do in deep with breathing in? We could have done everything, uh, but we use the core interaction is controlling buoyancy going up because on an instinctive human level, that feels more most logical. And if I would have done something else, if I would have, if we would have designed a maze game where every time you breathe in, you open a door and you go farther in and further in the maze, you know, it's a crude example, but it, it, it feels less logical. So that is where the fingerspitz and the fool comes in of, of the artist side of things, of finding the reality to con finding the virtual reality to connect to to the action that feels most human and most logical to do. And that's almost an instinctive thing. Unfortunately, we have to wrap it up here. I'm getting the sign from the back that we need to move on to um, the next speaker. And if you're interested in biofeedback and immersive technology, I urge you to listen to Paul Fletcher's talk. He is uh, an incredibly inspiring researcher. Thank you so in this much. Space. So thank you so much. Will you both be out in the hall? We will be out in the hall. If you'd like to talk to us more, please check out everyone's work. Work together with artists and scientists. Make cool things. Uh, please speak to Philip if you're interested in biofeedback and all the great work uh, at OpenBCI. And um, thank you so much.